bringing Gator Nation a different Gator great every episode. This is Jabari Gaffney, you're listening to the All For The Gators podcast. Hey, I'm Earl Everett. You're not a Gator, you're Gator bait. This is Bo Carroll. Hey, I'm Rita Anthony. This is Kiwan Ratliff, and you are listening to All For The Gators podcast. This is Seatric Faison, a.k.a. C4. This is Brandon James. This is Jack Jackson, Go Gators. Hi, this is your boy Jeremy Mincy, a.k.a. Mr. Mintz, and we were the All For The Gators podcast. This is Ben Trooper, you listening to the All For The Gators podcast. Hey guys, this is Jarvis Moss, Go Gators. You rocking with Lee Toe Shepard, and we all for the Gators podcast, man. Top notch. This is Chris Doring, and you're listening to the All for the Gators podcast. And now, your Gator alumni hosts, John, Andy, and Sid. Oh, gentlemen. Hey, Jabber. <laughs> That's how we're going to start the show. I like that. <laughs> so we've wanted to do this for a while now. We've been talking about it and talking about it, and I think it's time. One of all of our favorite parts of our show is when our friends of the show share their experiences with us about the old ball coach and give us the pleasure of their impressions of him. <laughs> John, do you have an impression of Coach Spurrier you could give us? I can't do any impressions. I can't. I could barely do myself. <laughs> Andy, what about you? You got an impression? Just the one I just did. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite one. Hey, Jabber. Yes, Jabbar Gaffney. I didn't really talk to Spur until um, actually I had uh, just came back from Pittsburgh and I had I had just told Pittsburgh that I was going to commit to them and I don't know if it got to Spurrier or something but as soon as I got home that night Spurrier called me with that little Spurrier Spurrier accent and hey hey Jabber uh, <laughs> we want to get him man <laughs> and I say all right coach I'm coming <laughs> you know doing the show now since the end of 2022 a common thread through all the shows is the effect of Coach Spurrier that he had on these players in the recruiting process, in practice, things he would say to them, things he would do, and the impressions that our guests would do of Coach Spurrier. It was a common theme through a lot of our shows. And we always said, you know, we should just put them all together and drop it as one show. And now we're going to do it. This might be our best show yet. <laughs> yeah, probably will be. We won't be talking. <laughs> okay, so who was your favorite Coach Spurrier impersonation we had on this show? If you could pick one. God, we've had some good ones. I think I'm, I'm partial to the, the Gaffney one that I mentioned, but man, there have been yeah. a ton of good Judd, ones. Judd Davis was very a good. Ton. Yes. <laughs> Guys, tons of stories. Too many for us to even remember. So we've picked out all the best ones. We went and we listened to all our shows and handpicked the very best ones. So here it is, our ode to the old ball coach, the head ball coach, through the stories of his former players, Gator greats, our guests, right here on the All for the Gators podcast. Will White. What were your first memories of Coach Spurrier when he literally arrived on the scene? I was like, who the hell is this guy? And what the <laughs> hell is about to happen else. I found out how competitive he was from day one. Uh, I say this, our defense was ranked number one, number two, very, very high uh, when Spurrier came in. And one thing that Spurrier did that for the defensive side is that we knew we got the ball back, which we were always great on defense, but we knew if we got the ball back to the offense, this guy was going to score. He was going to try to <laughs> score and try to bake the scoreboard in half, which made <laughs> us feel like, you know, hey, man, we get the ball back, we're going to score. And that score turned into winning. And so so what Spurrier did for us was uh, I called ourselves the pioneers. We kind of oh, you know, changed <laughs> things from, from the era of Coach Hall in six and five. You know, but the, the greatest have always been great. You know, uh, that era – which I give great respect to with Charlie Pell and some of the boys, Frankie Neal and and, and Lorenzo Hampton oh, and yeah. all those Gator greats that, that were before us. And then we kind of logged a little bit. Then Spurrier changed it around. Of course, Spurrier changed it around. So I was a part of that. And, I, and, and as far as the Gators are concerned, I just really appreciate the era that I was in. So, so you know, all the guys that came after me, you know, I just, I just smiled because – you know, I was down to that bottom foundational kind of turnaround. And uh, and it, 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 it was great. It was super. I wouldn't change a thing. Luke Rosa Award winner, Judd Davis. Being a kicker is pressure enough. But when you're doing when you're when you're the kicker for, coach, for Steve Spurrier, 
oh my gosh. I mean, the, the way I knew that we were going to kick is third down maybe fourth and you know seven. And basically, if if Coach Spurrier's visor is on the ground and he's walking away, <laughs> I, that's okay. Field goal. He might yell field goal, but if he had his hand on his chin, he was looking out. I knew we were going for it because he go. He went for it a lot. Sure. But I just always running out there. I guess it was just the fear of man. I, you know, he's like, you know, we didn't get seven. You damn well better get me three. And and he was not <laughs> one to you know rah rah. You made you, you know what do you want a medal? You're, that's your job. You're supposed to make it right. So that's right. kind of the no. I'm just supposed to make it. And I guess that's what made me be as successful as I was, just because he was the kicking coach. He would stand right behind me in practice and just make me unbelievably nervous. He was a kicker in his day, too, I'm sure, as he pointed out to you frequently, I would imagine. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. He would say to me, you know, Judd, you know, Judd, never missed. And I, I know, Coach, kicked the 40 yard and beat Auburn the year you won the Heisman Trophy. I mean, that, that's what's amazing. I mean, that, he kicked that. And I used to tell Danny Werfel, I'd say, Danny, can you imagine? Because I don't know if you guys know the story about that when Coach Spurrier kicked that field goal. The kicker was going out to kick it, and he told Coach Graves that he would kick it. And they pulled the kicker off, and Coach Spurrier went out and kicked it. That's a true story. Wow. <laughs> and, yeah, and he drilled And then that was the last game, and then he wins the Heisman, what, you know, a couple weeks later. And I used to tell Danny Werfel, I said, Danny, can you imagine you telling Coach Spurrier when I'm going out to kick a ball to win a game that you were going to kick it and tell me to get off? I mean, can you imagine that? And then Danny wins the Heisman. We used to just crack up thinking, who does that? I mean, that's the legend of, of Coach Spurrier. That's how you get a name on a stadium. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he was – I mean, he changed my whole life, obviously. I mean – if it wasn't for him, I mean, I was just a walk-on place kicker, and he gave me a shot, and that's the beauty of Coach Spurry. He didn't care who you were, five-star, superstar recruit, or just a walk-on nobody from Ocala, Florida. He doesn't care. He just wants to win. That's what I loved. He didn't care if you were a senior or a freshman. If you got it done on the field, you were playing, and I just love that about him. Kicking for Coach Spurry, he, he was a genius in the fact that it's so hard to replicate pressure in practice, right? Coach, you just try, but how do you replicate, you know, 90,000 in the swamp on national television or, or in the Georgia, it's, it's almost impossible, but every now and then we'd be in practice, you know, we're staying, I'm staying around doing nothing for two hours because you can't just continually kick and it's a hundred degrees. I've done nothing. And then we're, so he calls up the team and he would do this every now and then. And he'd say, okay, everybody, because Judd, he said, Judd's going to kick uh, three field goals from 45 yards. And, uh, Everyone he misses, it's a 200-yard sprint for the team. <laughs> and it would basically be on me. If I missed, the team would run 100-yard sprints. And they would get in a horseshoe around me. It was the most gut-wrenching thing. It was more nerve-wracking than the games, right? And these guys would be whispering in my ear, like, dude, you better not miss this kick. And I, I, I made them every time he did it. I don't think I ever the team ever, and they, when I did, they'd pick me up and carry me off the field. But every <laughs> coach that I've told that has, that Coach Burry did that, that made me kick to see how many sprints the team would run. I mean, they said, I'm doing that. I mean, I've told a lot of coaches that, and I, it's just impossible to replicate pressure like that. But he seemed to pull it off. So we're a week and a half before the first game, and I got in the, one of the only slumps that I can remember in my career where I didn't just kick at the ball without thinking and it went, it went straight. And look, I mean, I know now what I was doing. I was, I was kind of hooking my toe up and I could not, be, I couldn't kick the ball into a brand. I was kickers. It's called almost like an X ball where it was going, looked like an X in the air. And it's basically almost like hitting a golf ball and your the toe is up and you're hitting a hook or, a, and I'm, I mean, I am struggling. I'm either pushing it or pulling it, and Coach Spur is just annihilating me in practice. Oh, it grows a winner, can't kick it. I mean, it was just, I mean, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Of course he did. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, he, yeah, and um, just in his way trying to make me better. But so I'll never forget because I, I've played a lot of golf, my whole, a lot of tournament golf my whole life, and always kept it down. I mean, I've always, try to keep it around scratch my whole career. And I've always played with a lot of good players and, and kicking a football is exactly like hitting a golf ball. I mean, it's a, you can hit it fat, you can pull it, you can slice it, you can hook it. And your foot is the, is the golf club. It's the exact same thing. And I'll never forget. I'm laying in yon hall in my dorm. And I realized, cause I'm, I, I started realizing that my foot was coming through too far inside and I was basically pushing it or I would hit a hook. And I realized that I need to kick a fade like you wouldn't golf. I don't know if y'all are golfers, but to hit a fade, you want your club coming more down the line or almost across the ball, it feels like. So I remember I need to kick a fade. And I remember I went out 
an hour before practice that next day. And in three balls, I fixed it. Just thinking, pretending I was kicking a fade, like I was sitting a, a golf club and the ball just dead straight higher and man. And then that day in practice, I think I went like eight for eight all over the field and coach Spur. Judge back, judge back. He's <laughs> laughing. And he goes, he goes, I remember he goes, Joe, what'd you do? And I told him that I, I'm, I'm kicking a fade, coach. And, of course, he just thought that was the greatest thing ever, that I'm using golf <laughs> to fix my kicking. He, he loved he loved that. You hear that, just, just If anyone could appreciate that, it was coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just kicking a fade. You hear that? You know, he never, he never said anything to me, really, before I would go out. But I'll never – the one time – I don't know why he did this. We were playing Tennessee, what, my junior – was it my junior or my senior year? And it was in the swamp. And it's like a 45-yarder against Tennessee. And and I spurt, he says, "Well, if you're going, so I'm I'm about ten yards in the field, and I hear I hear Judd, <laughs> and I'm like, what? And I turn around, and he looks at me, and he points, and he goes, make it. He goes, make it. <laughs> and I go, and I'm thinking to myself, why? Why did he just stop me and tell me to make it? And I that's all he said. Up, and I re- yes, like, and I and I remember standing and taking my steps back, going, holy crap, he really wants me to make this. I mean, of course he does, right? But the fact that Coach Spurrier told me to make it. Now you have to make it. <laughs> I, and, and I remember when I when I put it through and I came back, and that's one of the few times he hit me on the top of the helmet like, good job. I, but I remember just going, why did he do that? It was terrible. <laughs> don't, tell, don't tell me to make it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it, it was um, it was it was fun. It was fun to play for Coach Spur. The, the stories that we I can tell you about Coach Spur, I mean, it's just unbelievable, man. The, 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 some of the things that he he just destroyed people. It, 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 if you were thin skinned, you just got to you just you couldn't be around him. That's just the way he was. Redell Anthony. I was on Georgia hard, but then the funniest thing was Coach Spur warmed me over in the most craziest way. So he came on the home visit and I had just came back from Georgia, great trip, whatever. And my mom had promised me I could use a car or something that day and she didn't let me use it. So Coach Spurs show up to the house right as we get through talking and he comes in and I admit I had an attitude and as we going through the home visit, he stopped like 15 minutes in, like, hey, Redell, you okay? Because, you know, since I'm happy, if you don't want me here, hey, I'll leave. I was like, hey, you know, that's the realest thing I don't heard in a long time. <laughs> and he still tells that story every now and then to this day. And I can't believe he remembers that, <laughs> you know. But when he did that, I'm like, Shoot, I, I, I got to play for him, you know, because <laughs> he like me. He just, you know, like, he don't care. Like, he going to get it done, and you get have your attitude, do whatever. Don't waste his time. <laughs> so I respected that, and I knew right then he's somebody I would love to be around. You know, you talked about working hard, and you caught 30 balls, 615 yards, and five touchdowns in the front end gun offense. Definitely flashing some big time you know, playmaking ability. Was it all the hard work or did the offense just click for you? Kind of, was it a perfect fit for you? Um, All the above. All the above? You know, the offense and all that could be perfect for you, but if you don't put in the hard work and you got to think, like you mentioned with that room, if you're not on it every day, someone else have a better day, hey, things change. So... You, know, you had to prepare as if you were a starter because, you know, because Spur would always have special plays for you, especially when you're a freshman because he's no the, the, the great thing about Coach Spur, he, he knows what you're great at when you're young to build confidence. Then he gradually gets you involved in other things. And a lot of football people will not understand that because they think of what they see on a video game, running around, able to run, cut, do that. Yeah, I mean, that's put in there. But when you have a young player, you have to find out what they're great at, get them success, then gradually give them more. And that's how you get you a complete player. You just can't throw them in there and say run six different routes as a freshman 
in front of 90,000 people and hey, if they do this coverage, you got to adjust this and that. That's a whole lot. But my thing as a freshman early was take the top off the defense. So that's what I ran. A lot of posts, a lot of go routes, a lot of corner routes. And as you can see, by my junior year, I ran in curls, I ran in digs. So that's the beauty of what Coach Spurrier does to develop his players. He only gives them enough that what they can handle, and then he gradually gives them more responsibility. Doug Johnson. Riedel was on with us. He spoke about Coach Spurrier building confidence uh, in his young guys, giving them like a little bit and then a little bit more that they can handle and how that philosophy sets players up for success, right, rather than failure the young guys. Do you feel that's how he approached it with you and your development? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Maybe he did that with the receivers. <laughs> there was no easing into anything when it came to our position. Quarterbacks got it a little different. <laughs> you either got it done or, I mean, you got to realize, I mean, he was our he was our head coach, but he was also – our offensive coordinator, and he was also our quarterback coach. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was no filter. <laughs> yeah, there was no – like you were getting truth serum right out the mouth. And knowing you, everyone knows him, he's he doesn't have a filter, right? <laughs> I mean, he's he's to the point, which I love about him, right? I mean, is it – was it tough? Yeah, yeah. So what, right? You know, so what? So that's why I was able to walk in – you know, as an undrafted free agent in Atlanta and look at Dan Reeves and tell him I'm better than anybody you got here <laughs> and proved it and proved it and was starting by the end of the year. So the, the Spurrier rubbed off on me. Right. right. So, but no, there was no, I mean, there was no easing into it. There was no worry about feelings and there was no worry about losing confidence. There was none of that. Let's talk about week two that year, Central Michigan. You throw those seven touchdown passes in the first <laughs> half. You tie an NCAA record, and the seven for the game ties SEC and UF records um, with Terry Dean. How do you remember that game? Do you remember all the receivers that caught those seven touchdowns? I remember some of them. I don't really, really remember <laughs> all of them. Um, but it's funny that, you know, that game and then – I had a game at Bandy. I don't know what year it was, where I, I was two yards away from breaking the school record for yards in a game, and coach pulled me out. I think it was like eight minutes left to go in the fourth, and he goes, "Nine four hundred and sixty yards." Yeah, he's like, "All right, you can get that record. You can get that record next year." <laughs> <laughs> and what's really funny? What's really funny is I missed uh, John Capel on a post. I overthrew him, which. You know, you ask, how could you overthrow John wow. on the post, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> coach looked at me, and we were watching tape, and he goes, nah, wouldn't overthrow him. You had the record. <laughs> so, oh, man. He loved to get those, loved to get those jabs. <laughs> but he did the same thing with the, you know, the, the seven touchdowns. Like, nah, you get that record next year. Lito Shepard. This is the first time we've gotten through a show with a player that played for Spurrier that didn't tell a Spurrier story. Do you have one? <laughs> or do an impression. Or, yeah, I was going to say, or an impression. <laughs> yeah. nah, you know, I, I learned a lot from Coach Spurrier, I tell you that. And I, I, just, I say the, the funniest thing that he's had to say to me, and I'll say this, I really have been on Spurrier's good side throughout my whole career. <laughs> So he hasn't had many things to say about me bad. But um, one, one year, I think it was my uh, my sophomore year, when I wasn't getting the stats that I, I, I thought I was, you know, hoping for because of the, you know, lack of, you know, action. But um, some of the receivers was, was messing with me or whatnot. And, you know, they was just calling me sorry and this and that. And, 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 and they asked Coach Spurrier for his opinion. And uh, Coach Spurrier was like, well, hey, I guess, you know, you just ain't got it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know? There it is. That's yeah, the it, is. Like, it was just one of those things like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Jack Jackson. Well, we've gotten some pretty cool stories about players being recruited by Spurrier. So you got any for us? Anything stand out? To be honest with you, I only met him twice. <laughs> I met him uh, okay. I met him on my official visit. And he did the in-home visit, 
and at the in-home visit, I, I never forget this. Uh, when he came in, my dad had the TV on, and uh, he came in and cut our TV off. My dad didn't like that that well. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful whose TV you turn off. It sounds yeah, like really. something spurrier with you. <laughs> Danny just basically, you know, he just take his steps and throw it as far as he could, and he just had receivers that could just go get it. <laughs> he sure did. So, yeah, so he, you know, I remember Coach Spur used to say, Danny, just take your steps and throw as far as you can. They'll go get it. <laughs> so, and that's basically, you know, when I look back at it I, and I I look at his performance over it, man, he, he was very good about just understanding that he had so many weapons around him and just don't mess it up. Zach Zadalis. I came in early and didn't take any visits. Uh, and mainly because, you know, where I played in high school at Santa Fe, uh, you know, Wiley Rich, who played for the University of Florida uh, years before me, but he was there when I got there as a freshman. Uh, he was, and I had two years with him. But another guy by the name of Doug Forrester played at Santa Fe, and he's the best lineman that ever came out of Santa Fe, and ha hands down. He had the flexibility. He had all these things that um, he would have been an NFL guy. Long story short, as he committed, Ron Zook was our recruiting coach. I was a sophomore. He was a senior. He commits to Florida, and his brothers went to ac on academic scholarships to the University of Auburn. And he'd go visit his brothers and hunt with them. And he had, you know, he had a, an, an Auburn hunting hat, like camouflage, but it had the University of Auburn. And Spurrier was speaking at a touchdown club. And they asked him, hey, you, you know, you guys got Forrester locked down at a local country, you know, a local uh, Gator club. And they're like, yeah. He's like, yeah, Forrester's coming to us. And they said, well, then why is he wearing an Auburn hat? Hmm. And that created, and this is not a joke, that created, Spurrier was like, you're either all for the Gators or you're not. And him wearing that hat, not even giving him a chance to explain, told Zook to call him and cut him. Done. And that was at his house. Wow. wow. That was at his house. Talk about a wardrobe malfunction. Oh, no. Ouch. I, and he, he had two cousins who were twins who played for the Gators in the 70s. Dennis and David Forrester, they played for the Gators. So he always wanted to be a Gator. And I tell you what, he, they took it from him, and, they, uh, and he ended up going to Auburn. Uh, but not not because he wanted to, because he really he really wanted to play for Florida. So that really you know that kind of kind of messed him up. And I saw that. I was like, man, I'm not I'm not letting that happen. Was he just you know the old ball coach to everybody on the team? Mm -hmm. He he stayed pretty consistent. I, I see. And another thing, I wasn't in the meeting rooms all the time with the receivers and quarterbacks. I was in. Usually, we'd have a group meeting together once a week, maybe twice a week, when we watch film or or depending on certain games that are coming up. And he treated everybody pretty much equally then. Uh, but I think, you know, individually, you know, no one was safe. I mean, no matter who you were, you're not safe. If you mess up, I mean, he's going to be on you, especially if you're not doing the right thing. Uh, so, I, was, I mean, a, a broad brush, I, I don't know if, he, to me, he did. But there may have been other incidences that I didn't know about and other players, how he, he dealt with them. But to me, he was... He was who he was uh, to everybody. And then that's even going up to, I mean, he called Bill Clinton Billy in, in DC. <laughs> I mean, we're, you're walking through the Secret Service and you got like, you know, hey, hey, Mr. President, hey, Mr. President, hey, Mr. President. Hey, Billy, how you doing now? How you doing? What's going on up here? That's he called President Clinton Billy. <laughs> you know, and I mean, he had his grandson, his grandson came out to practice one day. His grandson was trying to play quarterback. And he's like, uh, he's like, yeah, it's my my grandson Scotty, and uh, yeah, he wants to play quarterback. Not very good, but uh, he wants to play quarterback. <laughs> he said that right in front of him. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, ouch. And, and, he wasn't, and, and the thing is, people take that as, oh man, he was a jerk. He wasn't a jerk. He just that's who he was genuine with who he was. He's just real. <laughs> and and so he's sarcastic. And he, I mean, he would say numerous times, if you messed up, he'd be like, oh no, 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 it's not your fault. It's just our, it's just our dumbass coaches. We, you know, we just can't coach you. <laughs> and it was just, it was just this sarcasm that he was still insulting you by just you know but by saying oh it's the coaches we just can't coach him up you know yeah. he's just we can't do it so yeah uh, so you just knew that if he's not going to give his own grandson a break then uh well sure. i'm not i'm you, not asking for it you break. definitely got to earn it gators all-time leading scorer jeff chandler john mentioned you played a little bit of wide receiver in high school but Unfortunately, we didn't see any uh, receiving stats at UF, no fake field goals or anything like that. Did you ever get in his ear about you being able to run a pattern or anything like that? 
my biggest regret is that I didn't campaign hard enough for that right. when I was at Florida because he was the perfect coach for it. Um, he would have loved probably to do, you know, to work something like that in, but yeah, you know, he, they allowed me, uh, we played, I think Miami of Ohio to start the 2000 season. I think it was 2000 and he let me kick the ball off like a little dribble kick right to myself to pick the ball up, which I thought was like, (laughs) Hey, throw me a bone. I'll take it. You know, it's not a fake field goal, but you know, it still gives me a little bit of glory and make me feel like a football player a little bit. So they, he let me do that, but um, we never really practiced fake field goals or anything like that. He was, I think he was just kind of like a field goal is like a, a necessity that he didn't want to have to deal with because it means he didn't score a touchdown. So um, I, I just, yeah, for whatever reason, I, I used to see all these other kickers around the country and they, you know, do the ones where they, the holder flips it over his back sure. and the kicker runs around him and catches it. And I'm like, oh, that's my dream right there. <laughs> But unfortunately, you know, my number was uh, never called. And uh, Coach Spurrier let me kick a lot of field goals a lot more than he probably would have wanted me to kick. Well, now with the old ball coach being a kicker too, did, did he offer any like hands-on uh, coaching on the kicking or offer any uh, technique advice? It's funny you mention that because, yes, he had punting and kicking <laughs> advice because, you know, that's what helped him win the Heisman. And he would tell us that till you know, the sun went down about how great he was at kicking. But, you know, his style is not applicable to today. So I I had to remind him that we make a more athletic move when we kick. Yes. Compared to, you know, the little Papa shot kick. Like the straight on George Blanda kick. Yeah. 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 Two steps kick. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He would, he would always, because we would always get out to practice, you know, 30, 30 minutes early to warm up because our, our period of practice was always the first period. So the guys would stretch and then we'd go in the special teams. And so, while everybody else is getting their pads on, we were already out at the field. So he'd come out there early with us and he'd start to say, well, you know, you know, Jeff, I used to, I used to kick a few field goals. And so he would kind of tell us, you know, how great he was. Well, what do you, what do you think about this? You know, and he even would give our punters some tips on what he thought they should do. And you just kind of like nod and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And then when he leaves, you're like, all right, we're going back to what we were doing normally, you know? Um, But yeah, he was, he was always very, uh, you know, would spend time with us, just not not necessarily like time that really mattered, but just being around us, which I think made, made us feel like a, a bigger part of the team because he was never in special teams meetings or anything like that. He was too busy focused on the offense. So we sort of craved that, you know, maybe 15 or 20 minutes that we got before practice with him. Very cool stories. I imagine any attention you got from him had to be a plus. E.G. Ernest Graham. Ultimately, well, obviously, we're thrilled you came to UF, but um, what ultimately landed you on that decision, and what other schools were close, or was there no shot? You, you knew you were going to be a Gator all along. Yeah, it boiled down to Miami and UF. You know, Miami, you know, Miami's on probation, or they're just, get, just getting off probation, you know, during that time. Um, yep. It was it was really those two in the running. Right just outside of that was uh, Clemson, uh, Michigan, uh, you know, a lot of Big Ten schools because obviously, you know, being a bigger back, um, you know, I, you know, I had a lot of interest in, you know, you know, playing in the, you know, playing in the Big Ten, um, you know, so those are the kind of, kind of boil down to those things. Um, here at UF, obviously, you know, Teddy Dupay is like a brother to me, you know, so, um, you know, we wanted to go to school together. You know, Javon Curse is like an older brother to me. I grew up, you know, obviously, um, you know, with Javon. Um, you know, he was already here at school. Uh, you know, a guy running battle from Fort Myers was a walk on, you know, uh, you know, here and played at the University of Florida. So it was a lot of family, um, you know, here um, for me. Uh, I ended up committing at, the, you know, obviously one of the, you know, the best games at, in 1997, the Florida, Florida State game. Um, you know, it was one of the loudest games I've ever heard, you know, in the stadium. And uh, I ended up committing um, after that game. But, you know, it was a combination of family and then, you know, a mixture of just experience and experiences and uh, moments that I had at, at UF that got it done. Pretty strong baseball team back then. Still do. But yeah, back okay. then they were pretty a powerhouse. Were they Were they giving you the opportunity to potentially play baseball too? Yeah, yeah. We, we talked about it. You know, it was kind of short-lived. Like I said, <laughs> I still remember kind of the day I was coming down the hallways after spring and coach was just like, uh, hey, my man, how you doing? You know, we were just talking about, you know, just talking about the spring and stuff. And it was just like, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if going out for baseball is going to be the best idea. 
And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, I was like, all right. You know, that, you know what goes first. Just all matter, matter of fact. And he just kind of kept walking. Up. That was like the end of my baseball, my baseball career for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> for the most part, you know. Um, you know, but yeah, we did talk about it. I talked about it at one point with, um, you know, Coach Lopez, but it never. Uh, I never got back off the ground after that. Another solid Spurrier impression. We've had a lot of those. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Add that to the list. The running backs kind of know what the plan was going to be going into each game. Did you kind of have an idea how many carries you're going to get per game, or was it kind of Spurrier each game playing hot hand, or how kind of how he felt? Yeah, the assumption was that we weren't going to get it a lot. <laughs> okay, I'll okay. be honest with you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that was always the <laughs> assumption. Um, but – you know, we knew, like, for instance, if we came off a loss, you know, typically people would hear it. We would, you know, coach would kind of hear it some about us not running. And the coach would kind of make it a point to come back and really run it. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, you know, most games, man, you know, if we we kind of knew if if we got the ball early in the game and we just say we, we, we you know, we ran an explosive, we broke off like a 15-yard run. We just knew coach was like, all right, you know, we, we've got to respect in the run. We're going to throw it now, you know, like <laughs> – and that would be it, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, we know if we got it early, we better try to find it a way to put it in that end zone or, we you know, we possibly might not, you know, get it back. Um, you know what I mean? So, you know, most of the time we knew we were going to play, like, in a more versatile role and we had to be active at all facets of, you know, the running back position. But we did know those games where, you know, coach was going to be, you know, kind of making a point to run the rock, you know what I mean? So... Yeah, and I guess his his scheme didn't quite lend it to uh, how other coaches, if they get a big lead, they may run the ball a little more in the second half. No. He, uh, yeah, he just chucked no. it all game. <laughs> <laughs> no, he chucked, he chucked it all game, man. We we knew that. You know, we understood it. We were, we were good with it. We knew that was, you know, Florida football. But, yeah, man, I mean, if you got down, I mean, it was times we could get down the goal line and he might go up the, down on the goal line. I mean, that's just the way it was, and, and we, we understood it. Gotcha, gotcha. How about the punting on third down? How did that affect you guys? <laughs> Oh, we, I mean, we just, I mean, you know, you get used to coach, you know, personality. It didn't send a message. I don't know that it frustrated <laughs> us. It just, you, you just understood that that was coach, you know what I mean? And he was going <laughs> to kind of express his, you know, express his frustration. If he wasn't happy with what was going on, he was going to let you know about it. Uh, and he was kind of unpredictable like that. You know what I mean? Like if things that he would say or things that he would do. And uh, it made him really authentic. You know what I'm saying? That's one thing I always say about coaches. You know, coach was really, uh, you know, authentic, man. And um, sure. it kept it live. Um, there's a spirit about him. You know what I mean? And I, and I think we we kind of played with that same spirit kind of that he had. And um, and that was to do what was needed and to, you know, to play loose and and um, just win the game. I mean, we just didn't think about losing, dude. Like, you know, like if we were down to, you know, Georgia, it's just we didn't just didn't think about not making the play. Like, it's just, you know, something that coach kind of, um, you know, kind of instilled in us as a group. Mike Pearson. Let me ask you, you brought up Rob Roberts. Um, let me ask you about that ride you had in the back of his pickup truck in the parking lot Ugh. of the O-Dome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we, we can laugh about it now. Um, it was just, I would say, not being a very, as Coach Furry said, Kind of being a dumbass. So, <laughs> I, lo, long story short, you know, I, I think some of you guys recall that a lot of us football players rode around in our uh, our scooters. You know, we thought we were like this these these badasses riding around in scooters, but looking like a bunch of circus bears on a tricycle. So, <laughs> anyhow, you needed them. There was the only circus. six thousand spaces for forty thousand students. Those well, things those things were a lifeblood on right. the campus. <laughs> right. That and then and then riding your bicycle to to class at 300 pounds is, is yeah. not fun so motorized <laughs> motorized vehicles is better so anyway we're on the third level of the parking garage rob and i put our scooters in the back of his truck rob being the smarter guy and one of the smartest guys we know says come on let's get in the front i'm like no no i'll sit back here and hold them long story short he's basically firemen carrying me into shan's hospital and i kind of come to and from what we could best understand is i'm six seven standing up there's no roof on the third level of the parking garage oh. I'm going with this. the back of my head collided with a concrete beam in the parking oh. garage oh my god and 
I came to, and I mean, I've got just obviously I'm covered in blood and I look at Rob and I said, Hey Rob, I think my nose is bleeding. He's like, shut up, dude. Like, <laughs> so, you know, I think by the grace of God, honestly, like a hey, Rob was the right guy to, to be there in that crazy moment. Cause I think if it would have been me on the other end, I would have probably panicked and just sat there and, and shock and, and not moved, you know, frozen. But then also we were, you know, two lights away from Shan's hospital right on campus. Thankfully. So I think, yeah, but um, I guess the, the, the silver lining of that whole story is I can no longer smell. Like I can't smell at all. Wow. So you guys could have some terrible BO. You could rip in front of me. <laughs> I, I've, I've never been allowed to claim that I can't change any diapers because I can't smell them. So wow, that was my, uh, that was my saving grace when having three little boys is that, I mean, when you, when I say I can't smell a thing, I, I cannot smell one thing. It was because of the skull fracture. So your nasals uh, aside, how in the world did you come back from a skull fracture so fast? I mean, did you started 33 consecutive games, so you didn't even miss a start from that. That's that's yeah. Sounds like Terminator kind of stuff. Like, yeah. how is that even possible? Uh, <laughs> I'm a fast healer. I, I really don't know. I, I, I would say had that happened today, they, they may have kind of not that they weren't, um, you know, caught or, or aware of or being safe, but I don't know. I just, I took two weeks off, um, kind of just laid down, rested, and then took another x-ray and kind of like Billy Bob on, on varsity blues. They said they scanned my cat and I was good. So, <laughs> I went back and, uh, you know, started working out. I'd, I would say, again, a little silver lining. I missed all of two today, so that wasn't that bad. <laughs> Positive line. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't, I didn't have to do any two days. And, and uh, other than Coach Spurrier, kind of every other day, Marky, you ever heard of Wally Pip? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Coach, I, I know who Wally Pip is. I know, yeah, I know who Wally Pip is. Uh, I love the Billy yeah. Bell reference, though. That's oh. great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So you blocked for Rex. You had you had Ernest Graham in the backfield. You had Rand Carthon. You had um, Gillespie. Did you prefer pass blocking or run blocking? Did you prefer one over the other, or um, did it matter? It didn't matter. I mean, I, I, w- I would say obviously in in coach's offense, um, the priority was to to be a better pass blocker because a lot of times our our run blocking were were draw plays where we're just shoving an end up the field. So. I was, I guess I would say I was better at pass pro. Um, you know, as Coach Perry said, Mike was not that tough. He just blocked the DN. That's all we need to do. So, <laughs> just, you know, my, my job was pretty easy. It, was, it wasn't, you know, I was telling somebody that the story the other day is I learned pretty quickly um, in the team meetings, you know, don't try to argue back and forth with the coach because he's going to have an answer. He's going to kind of get you. And so he says, Michael, how, how many coverages do you think the QB's got to know? I'm like, five, coach. He's like, we got to know 22. <laughs> and you just got to know one thing, block that guy. That's all I need you to do. <laughs> so he had a way of simplifying it, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. He, I mean, and pretty much what was great about coach is if you did your job, he moved on. Like he didn't, he didn't really bother with you too much. And, and frankly, I don't think he really knew exactly what offensive lineman did other than just need a basketball. That was his whole <laughs> Tony George. I remember that first year, because that was my first year that I redshirted. I remember Larry Kennedy getting hurt, and Coach Burry said, I think you're ready to come out of your shirt right now. And it was against Georgia. I said, Coach, if you need me, I'm ready. And I was so excited. But Coach Burry's like, you know, I don't want to waste the whole year on him just off of this one game. And, and I, um, you know, it was it was just one of those 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 euphoric moments that you'll never forget because Coach Spurrier felt comfortable enough to be able to say, I think you're ready. I've seen you work. Let's go do this. And it made me feel that that built my confidence for the off season to go into the off season. And I, I when I tell you I went to work after that, I I literally I was looking looking for for, for the weights at every hour of the day trying to find it to make it happen. Our biggest competition was never at the game. That was the easy part. Our biggest competition was at practice. And it was it got to the point where it used to get so heated. We had to practice separate with, from the defense and the offense because the Coach Perry would get into it with Coach Stu. That's how heated it got. Like it was it was intense, intense. And they weren't talking to each other. 
And we out there like, man, how, what happened? What we do? We like, and, and Coach Stoops like, well, nothing. You got to just keep shutting him down. Keep shutting him down. He got this strong, raspy <laughs> voice. Oh, my goodness. He, and he was just, you just keep shutting him down. They're not going to catch a dang ball over here. And, and you know what I'm saying? Dang. <laughs> and and, and Brad's like, all right, let's go. We got, we got something for that. Yeah, okay. you, got, you two guys don't even go touch it. Let's run it down. Let's go run it down. Post. Okay, we get this double post. We, we'll see you got this right now. We got something for you right now, T. George. All right, well, bring it on, Coach. <laughs> but it was, it was the greatest atmosphere for football because we knew – when we went out there underneath one of the smartest defensive coordinators that I've ever played with, both college pros, high school, and probably the smartest offensive genius that I could think of at Coach Spurrier, that it was every day in practice, your A game was required. Like, you weren't going to get a day off. Like, you had to go. You're talking about – Chris Dorn, Aubrey Hill, J- Jaquez Green, Riddell Anthony, Ike Hillier, Lafise Kareem, Travis McGriff, Jack Jackson, the first year. Man, like, and all of those guys had to line up and run past me, and every last one of those guys beat me. And then Coach said, You sure you're all American? <laughs> I'm like, Man, look. I, hey, look. <laughs> I had to get the weight rule. Travis McGriff. It's funny because I can I can hear Spurrier getting on me in the meeting room right now. <laughs> but, you know, it was always drilled into our head when you catch the ball, really, you know, look it in with your eyes and tuck it away. And on the first play, when they throw me the hitch, my eyes are so far away from that ball. I, I'm looking downfield, <laughs> ready to run. And I remember Spurrier making kind of a funny jab like he always does about, hey, you know, you got to look the ball in. You know, fresh. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was just kind of nuts. And then uh, our next game was against Kentucky, and I caught one ball. But what was kind of clear after after that second game against Kentucky was that because of, you know, Jack and Aubrey and Chris and Redell and Ike, that my playing time was going to be a little bit limited and it may be a bit of a waste to not redshirt me. And so the inside story of this is that we're eating in Yon Hall and Spurrier walks in behind me and he says, Trav, you know, your ankle been bothering you? And I kind of look at him and I was like, uh, <laughs> not really, man. What? You know, no. And he said, yeah, he said, yeah, I think you need to go see Chris Patrick, the trainer. And so about that time, I'm sort of catching on like, all right. So I go see CP and he says, um, Trav, we're, <laughs> you got a nice problem and we're going to medically register you. And, you know, back then you could do it if you had only played a certain percentage of games. And we were right there at that point. And so I was actually, you know, there was a small part of me that was disappointed, but the majority of me was happy about it because I wasn't going to burn a year. And, you know, I had played in a couple games and gotten some experience and caught three or four balls. And um, anyways, that's that's how that played out. That was a big Dr. Spurrier to the rescue. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Dr. Spurrier. (laughs) And then the South Carolina game cool part about that one it was my last home game at florida it was homecoming and you know you just couldn't really script it any better but here's here's a funny story i'm gonna bring it full circle back to your your uh your ricky pearsall thousand yard situation okay so somewhere in the third quarter about halfway I, i i have 13 catches and whatever I ended up with, 220-some yards, two touchdowns, and we still have a quarter and a half to go. The record, the all-time record for catches was 15 for Carlos Alvarez, and at the time, I think Taylor Jacobs got it, but at the time, Carlos Alvarez's record was 237 of yards. And it, that was at an away game. He didn't have that in the swamp. Nobody had more than 220 whatever I had in the swamp, but Carlos had more away from the swamp. Well, nobody knows records better than (laughs) Steve Spurrier. He knows them all and he knows them in his head (laughs) and they pull me out. 
And I didn't know where in the world I was at the time, but as the third quarter's wrapping up, SID comes over and he says, hey, you're at 13 catches for whatever yards. So they come to me and tell me that, and, you know, it's it's the fourth, we're way up, and we're starting to get some of the backups in, and I, I just kind of shrugged, and I thought, well, there's no way I'm walking up to him right now and saying, Coach, will you put me in and let me get a couple catches, and if I just get a couple catches, I'm sure I'll get over the yards. It just felt way too selfish. But I, I'm sitting there thinking, I know he knows this. <laughs> I, he knows records like the back of his hand. If it's receiver, running back, quarterback, he knows them. And he didn't put me in. So for whatever reason, that was the decision he made. And, you know, it, it is what it is. And I, I certainly can't complain about a, a, a big day like that, 13 catches or whatever it was, 220-some yards, couple In two and a half quarters, you said that was? That, that's ridiculous. He, Mike Natil. Did Coach Spurrier announcing he was leaving to go to the NFL impact you? Um, it did. Uh, it definitely um, uh, made me weigh my options about coming back to school. Uh, you know, Coach Spurrier recruited me. He was the only coach I wanted to play for. Uh, just to know uh, who the new head coach was going to be and how he was going to handle things around the building. It definitely changed my mindset. Um once he said he was going to leave, because I mean, no one on the team knew. Wow! I actually heard I heard about it over ESPN um, after the bowl game. I was still down at I was still down in Miami hanging out with Clint Portis. Um, <laughs> I saw it on on the ESPN that he was going to be leaving, and then everybody got a text about the, the email about a team meeting. So, and the crazy thing about the meeting was, as soon as I walk in the team locker room, Miss Jerry, his wife, she she looks at me and she goes, "Mike, I didn't know. I swear I didn't know." Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so Miss Jerry, she didn't she didn't want to leave Gainesville at all. And we didn't want to leave either. But you know, things change and things happen. So uh Coach Spur, you want to, you know, uh, you know, uh see what the NFL had to offer and and see if he can, you know, take his style of play from college to the NFL. So We've had a lot of players on from the Spur era. Um, some pretty good imitations of him. Are you a Spurrier impersonator? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can have. There's a few things that <laughs> you would have around the movie. <laughs> you got to give us one. Yeah. Yeah. And he was always saying, uh-huh, don't, don't touch the receivers, linebackers. Don't touch them. <laughs> <laughs> So we never, we never put, we never test his receivers on crossing rounds. Just say that. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Doring. Your touchdown record when you finished your Gator career at the time was an SEC record and a Gator record. It still stands at UF. Do you see that getting broken anytime soon with the new transfer portal, players leaving early, things like that? I mean, yeah, Jabbar obviously got close with a couple of years of stats, but it, I just, I don't know. I'm not sure it's going to get broken anytime soon. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, you can look at that. It is, you know. People leaving early and moving around, that that definitely plays a part. But also, you know, the proliferation of the passing game, too. What we were doing was very unique. Now everybody's kind of doing a lot of the same things. So there are more opportunities as well. But uh, you go back and look for a while. Even I think if you look at that list, like I I held that record for 25 years. Devontae Smith broke it two years ago. If you go back and look at that list, it's littered with Florida receivers that played for Coach Spurrier, you know, and it just goes to speak to the things that Coach Spurrier was doing well ahead of his time. What anybody else was doing and the way that he revolutionized the uh, the game of college football, man, it's just a really special thing for me as a lifelong Gator fan growing up the son of, of two Florida grads who told me about what uh, Steve Spurrier meant you know, as a player. And that was like really the only – the only thing that you could celebrate as a Florida fan for a long time, there were no national championships. There were no SEC championships. There were no, there was nothing except the one Heisman Trophy winner we had. And for him to come back in 1990 and take over the program and then to lead us to kind of the success that we did that springboarded us to the you know, three national titles that the school now has, the, the three total Heisman Trophy winners, you know, all the different records and, and uh, success that, that we had in the SEC record books. It just, Really cool to have been a part of that whole run up. And then I remember Coach Spurrier after that, that 2001 season making the announcement that he was leaving and how devastated all the Gator fans were. And I was probably the only one that was happy at that point because I knew Coach would sign me. Um, I was one of the first guys that he signed uh, when he got up to Washington. And it was really a lot of fun being with Coach and, and all the assistants that had been at Florida when I was there and certainly with Danny and Shane and 
Jacquez and Riedel and, you know, it's just a, a big reunion for us and a, a chance to reconnect with some of those guys and playing an offense that I was obviously very familiar with and had a chance to help everybody else kind of get up to speed at the receiver position that didn't know the offense as well. So, you know, I owe a lot to coach. Coach let me walk on and, and as a preferred walk on at Florida, gave me the right to compete like everybody else and ultimately the chance to to catch the touchdowns that I did and have the, the opportunity to go to the NFL and then revitalize my career after I'd been injured. So just uh, had two of my best years, probably that year in Washington and the next year in Pittsburgh when I went to the Steelers and just can't say enough outside of my parents. I don't know if there's anybody that's impacted my life the way that Coach Spurrier has. Well, there you have it. All of our Coach Spurrier stories and impersonations from all of our episodes of the All for the Gators podcast wrapped up into one And uh, I'm going to put a nice little bow on it here and uh, just say that we hope to have Coach on in the future. At some point, that would be the ultimate Gator great guest, I suppose, right? Heisman came back to coach, changed college football, uh, won a million SEC championships in a row, a national championship, the Gators first in football, uh, Coach Spurrier. One of a kind, that's for sure. So is this podcast. So, you know, make sure you subscribe wherever you you get your podcasts, whether it's Apple or Spotify or YouTube. You know, go there and subscribe so you don't have to wait until we post to find out there's a new episode. It'll come right to your phone like magic. It's beautiful. It's a good thing. Until next time, I'm John Spano, your lead host and producer of the All for the Gators podcast. Go Gators. Go Gators.